Welcome to The Rabbi and the Shrink. It's a podcast about ethics unscripted. I'm the shrink, Dr. Margarita Guri, and my favorite rabbi. Madison Goldson. <laughs> and we are delighted to have with us a repeat performer, Giancarlo Pitoco. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for having me back. It's a delight to be with the two of you again. Exactly. Well, we're addicted to you, so, you know... <laughs> You, your whole thing is about digital stuff as distractions and increasing quality of life and all. And you become one of our lovely, um, non-distracting repeat things. So <laughs> about Thank cultivating you. healthier relationships. Um, and I saw on your website something I thought I'd kick off with that and then we'll get to talking. The greatest thing we can do is to help somebody know they're loved and capable of loving. Mm. Mr. Fred Rogers. Mm -hmm. oh, so why did you pick that sir hero of mine mr rogers oh my goodness um we're both from pittsburgh he did his all of his work in pittsburgh um have wonderful memories of of him and the lessons he teaches and i think he um he got a, a reputation for being someone that was just kind of, I don't know, boring or Bob Ross for kids or something. No, um, no I love Bob Ross, but that that calm, simple energy. I mean, the way he talked was so slow, but the wisdom that came out was so profound. The way he understood human psychology. If you heard him, if you still listen to him, you can go see tons of his videos on YouTube and, and they've made movies and documentaries about him now. Um, I think there's an appetite for an energy like his in our modern times where we seem to be more divided. Um, we're very quick to step on the gas pedal when someone says something that we disagree with, which, you know, fabulous that you two can come from different perspectives. And I think you embody a lot of that. But I think fundamentally what Mr. Rogers approached things from was this idea that you, you can love anyone. You can love anyone if you really understood where they were coming from, the kind of life they lived, how they were raised, the experiences they've had. And the greatest wisdom traditions on earth often teach us that um, you would be the same as that other person uh, across the table from you if you had lived life uh, through their eyes, their shoes. Um, so I think it's a pretty fundamental insight about humanity that if we would take the time to really consider and understand where someone's coming from, we would feel that deep affinity for them, that love, that compassion. But we so often just gloss over that and skip. We don't have the attention span to pay attention long enough to really understand something. We want the too long, didn't read, the TLDR, the headline version of it that glosses over everything. We do that to people. We do that to events happening in the world. Uh, you name it, uh, we, we filter everything instead of seeing what's actually in front of us. We're not present enough. We don't have the attention for that anymore. So, yeah, I mean, it says a lot. It's, it's a fundamental seed of, of a lot of the work that I do and, and how I try to approach things. Yeah, you put me in mind, um, this is, sounds like a bit of a, a, a tangent, but uh, I, I was at the gym working out and scrolling Rabbis through the Rabbis work like, out? Let me imagine. This. <laughs> Rabbis work out. Yep, yep. I mean, really? I okay. got an exemption. I got an exemption. Uh, <laughs> I'm allowed to work out. Uh, but, and, and even worse, I was looking for something to watch on the television screen. Um, and I came across this movie with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. I hadn't seen it before. It was right in the middle. So I had no idea what the plot was. Two people in an office having a conversation. And I couldn't pull myself away from it. There were no guns going off, no mm. bombs exploding, mm. no cars speeding, nobody's getting undressed. It was just dialogue and character development oh whoa that and you know it, it was from an age when that's all they had <laughs> to yeah. keep audience engagement but it, it serves me as, as a perfect example of what you're saying that we want the flashbang we want the glitz we want we want everything really fast and really exciting and really bright and really shiny and 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 there's no substance there. I mean, what is glitter? <laughs> it's just, it, it's a, a shiny paper. It's there's a nothing. dopamine trigger. 
and exactly. we're all addicted to dopamine. That's why there's the, the trend I've seen lately is taking a dopamine fast, which means putting down all those things that are full of glitter, uh, your smartphone, social media, even television, you know, take your pick. I mean, take a look at a move to your point, take a look at a movie trailer um, from this year and compare it to a movie trailer from 1995, uh, pre 2000. Uh, and, and you'll see a very different pace of cuts of the length of, of scenes that they show. Um, just like you're talking about uh, any of Humphrey Bogart's films, people are often shocked at how long a scene will go on for. Whereas now it's quick cuts. You look at a trailer, you're lucky if uh, an individual cut, a contiguous film lasts longer than two seconds in most trailers these days, especially with all the action driven films, they set pace by cut, 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 cut. It's a, it can be very disorienting, but we're, um, this is part of what's happening is we're getting used to this level of dopamine, this level of stimulation. And when we don't have it, we crave it. It's, 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 it has recalibrated our brains um, to, to expect and demand it and feel bored if we're not. That's what happens because boredom is also that lack of dopamine. Um, it's, it's, it's more than that, but that's, that's one of the symptoms of boredom is the lack of Then dopamine. we feel dissatisfied in our relationships. Yeah. Because we don't have the patience to spend time talking to people and listening and, and hearing and them talk about what's important to them or just what they want to talk about. And, and you know, we're, we're looking at our phones under the table or over the table, uh, trying to get something to fill in that lack of, as you say, dopamine. And we're really depriving ourselves of true value and true connection and, and really the key to true happiness because that all comes from relationships. Oh yeah, Marion Williamson often says, um, the only thing missing from any situation is what you are not giving. And I love that kind of radical responsibility, whether it's a complicated relationship with someone or feeling bored, um, feeling upset about something. The only thing missing is something you're not giving, is saying you have autonomy, you have um, control here over your own lived experience and, and what's happening here. And I just love that. In any occasion, I'm thinking, you know, what what is it that I'm not giving? But, you know, that instead of defaulting to our usual roles and habits and the grooves, the patterns in our brain, think about well, what's what? There's what I would usually do here, or what my job title says I should do here. If we're talking about a professional setting or societally, what is my role here? I'm a parent, or I'm a teacher, or I'm a take your pick. Instead of thinking based on the label look and listen and, and see what, what can I give here? Whether we're talking about ourselves or something bigger, um, you know, if we're bored, <laughs> it's not just, don't just reach for the phone. Don't look for external things. Why am I bored? What do I really want? Am I craving real human connection? Well then- and what am I avoiding? On Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So the rabbi and I uh, often talk about ethics and ethical muscles. One of the things that my precious, my phone, <laughs> does is it helps me avoid anything I don't want to deal with it's hours and hours and hours of yumminess without <laughs> thinking what what a wonderful a brain break but it's breaking my brain not giving my brain a break um and mm -hmm. like the rabbi and I were talking about boundaries and setting limits and and all of this so I think rabbi we're at the point where you and I uh, he and I were talking about having you back and talk about one of your five insights so if you wouldn't mind repeating briefly your five insights and then we wanted you to focus on the boundary of the insights because the rabbi and i devoted to helping people not only understand the ethics behind stuff but what do we need to do to get there oh boy yes so boundaries one of the most important things um but the the five insights really revolve around number one, most importantly, we've already touched on it a bit here today, is yes. the power of your attention and it being the, the great superpower you've been given as a human being for creating the kind of life that you wanna live. So attention, number one. Number two is values. So being in touch with the kind of values that are important to you, that you want to shape the big decisions and small decisions you make in your life, whether it's the everyday stuff about 
what are the kinds of boundaries I need here and now or, or whatever, your values can, can define that for you. They become the guideposts, um, the advisors to you if you can tap into what are my important values. And if we're talking about a family context, what are our values we want to live by? And the next one being boundaries, I typically talk about as part of that because they go hand in hand. If you uh, have mastery over your attention, know your values, you can set some healthy boundaries based on that, that are really well informed and personal rather than looking externally for other people to tell you what those boundaries should be. Um, and then the last two, uh, leisure time. We've lost the fine art of leisure time, meaning how do we recharge our batteries when we're not doing the things that we have to do, those gotta do's, like your job being usually the biggest one um, or your role in your family, whatever that might be, if for your spouse or for your kids or for all of them together. Um, what do you do when you're, you have time that you get to choose what you do with it? And we often choose things that... <clears throat> drain our energy rather than energize us and it's yes. counterintuitive we talked about that a little bit last time leisure time and the last one is solitude solitude probably the the most lacking and missing one on this list maybe other than attention is uh the ability to be free from the thoughts and ideas of others um joseph campbell talks about having something called a bliss station um which is a place where i'm gonna butcher the quote but it's like have a time of day or a place where you are, uh, where you don't know what anyone owes you, what you owe anyone. You don't know what's in the news headlines or anything like that. Um, that means put the phone down, turn off the screens around you, put down the newspaper and just be with yourself. Just, and be with nature, be with, be with the environment that you're in, but be free from information and other things coming at you that aren't your own thoughts and ideas. So we wanted to address the issue of boundaries, but also how to prepare other people and ourselves for the leisure time and the solitude using the boundaries. Yeah. Uh, and you and I had talked about the accountability. Rabbi, was there something else you wanted him to address before we let him loose on humanity? <laughs> No, but I think you, you, you just put me in mind something I haven't thought about in a, a long time. I, I read an interview once with Larry Hagman. Yes. Uh, of uh, you know, JR and Drew of Genie fame. And he used to, he had a practice. He didn't speak on Sundays. Hmm. And all of his friends and family knew that he didn't talk. He took a, a, a word fast uh, every Sunday. And, you know, it really forced, you know, he did it because he wanted to force himself to unplug. And this was, this was before all our devices existed. Well, but today um, his thumbs would be going crazy. Well, <laughs> that's a good point. There's a thumb fast included. Um, <laughs> but there is an idea of, of a technology status, not just technology fast, that people mm -hmm. really unplug one day a week. Um, so, you know, again, setting these boundaries for ourselves, it takes discipline. It can be scary. I oh, mean, yeah. you know, in, in our culture, the, 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 the actual Sabbath, we don't use electricity. We don't travel. And people say, well, my gosh, 25 hours where you can't do anything. Isn't that boring? <laughs> it's all how you look at it because it's 25 hours where you don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. And you can just be with your friends and your family and your community. And those boundaries then help structure the rest of our week. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you for, uh, to amplify. And dun, da, 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 da. It's all yours, sir. <laughs> you hit on a really good point there uh, that I spend a lot of time talking to teams about in particular, which is creating structure and more so now than ever because people aren't in uh, offices that gave us uh, a lot of structure having to go into work every day. Uh, being away from home, being away from other responsibilities, you're isolated in an office from aspects of your personal life, that brought structure into your life uh, in a way that we don't have when we're at home and all the lines are blurred. And so boundaries, I'm so glad we're talking about it because it's a, a, something that we're being called upon, especially those of us still working from home, to create and enforce 
uh, more than ever because we used to depend on our environment and the change, you know, going yes. through the commute to do that. Now we've got to be more self-regulating. And that's what boundaries are about is having some discipline in how you spend your time, being really intentional uh, about how you spend your time and the kind of structure you want to give your day, your week, your month, your year. Uh, not a lot of people think in these terms, um, but it's really helpful because boundaries create space for you to apply your attention purposefully, um, navigate by your values. If you are creating some compartments uh, that are purpose-built time compartments that are purposeful, <laughs> uh, thinking about when do I do my best work? Um, there's a, a wonderful book, I think it's by uh, Daniel Pink called When. And one of the things that he explores in there, the whole theme of the book is like, when is the ideal timing for certain kinds of things? And one of them is when do you do your best work? And um, through all kinds of scientific studies, they've you know explored the how brain chemistry works and energy moves through different kinds of people. And there are certain times a day that work for you to give your best gifts to whatever your, your, your practice is. So if it's, if you're a writer, um, a lot of writers talk about how they do their best work in the mornings or the nights. A lot of creative folks are on the extreme ends of the spectrum, but some people, you know, it's, it's late morning or early afternoon, finding your prime time for accomplishing certain things where you're, your energy, both physically and emotionally, feel aligned to the task at hand, it's important to be sensitive to those kinds of things. So I'm speaking more from a professional or creative standpoint, but um, those are time boundaries in terms of using your energy really well. Uh, there are other kinds of boundaries, like how do I let my kids um, use their devices and get online and, and chat with people and use Snapchat and send photos of themselves and their lives and in moments when I can't see what they're doing? I don't know what they're sending. Um, I don't know what they're talking about on there. So how do you set healthy boundaries there? And I think, you know, in those contexts, a lot of times we set boundaries out of fear. And we just want to clamp down and say, you're not allowed to use these things. Or it's like, I don't know. I've never been on TikTok. I don't know what they do on there. And it's kind of like a shrug, like helplessness. Uh, I see that with a, a lot of the families and, and parents in the audiences or when I've consulted them one-on-one. -on -one. It goes one of two ways. Total fear. They want to clamp down and make the internet, you know, Fort Knox for them in their house. Or they're like... I don't know, it's, it's the kids these days or it's the schools, you know, not regulating it enough. I'm not seeing enough responsibility there. And that's what boundaries are about. First and foremost, taking responsibility for yourself and how you choose to apply your attention and behavior in different ways or keep certain things in uh, and, or keep certain things out, let certain things in. Um, yeah, would love to see more of that. More, more thoughts about... <clears throat> I noticed that when we all use our devices at dinner time or have them available, that we don't really interact with each other so much. We go through a mechanical process of eating food and staring at our phones. There are a lot of people for whom that's that's a typical dinner time. You know, two parents and kids around a table and smartphones all in their pockets around the table. That's I like when families don't talk to each other because then they need a consultant or a coach. This is very good for me. <laughs> I, I tell the families, spend time at meals, um, have a phone pile, a phone stack yeah. where you don't touch the phone, talk to each other. I know it can be dangerous, but you know what they end up doing? They end up scolding or planning or talking about things that, that aren't fun. They ruin that time you were talking about the discipline. So how are you advising people to use this scary unhooked time, undigital time? How do you advise them to use it wisely? Well, I advise them to use that time for activities that give them energy, that leave them feeling energized. And um, there's a, a great concept called the Bennett Principle uh, that Cal Newport talks about in his book called Digital Minimalism, which I just love. Um, great, great insights in there. But he talks about how uh, it's shown that the activities that require more energy from us to perform tend to um, leave us feeling more energized. So it's an investment of your attention and your effort in order to get positive energetic returns. And uh, let me explain what that means a little bit. So after a long day, a lot of people like to go home 
and turn on TV. And they say, I just want to turn my brain off for a while. So I'll watch something stupid on TV or a few episodes of blah, 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 insert show here. Um, and they think that's how they need to recharge their batteries because they've been busy all day. Their brain's been engaged. They're stressed. They're tired. They just want to turn, it, turn off my brain at the end of the day. And we think that's going to recharge us, but it doesn't. Uh, it leaves us feeling less energetic afterwards, less recharged. I don't know anyone who walks away from a couple hours of watching TV or scrolling through feeds that jumps up feeling like, ah, oh, man, that was time well spent and I'm ready you know, to call it a day <laughs> and um, go to sleep so I can do this all over again. Never, never. But the tasks that, and it's counterintuitive, right? You think, well, I've been thinking and working and dealing with people and communicating all day. I just wanna do something where I can kick back and relax and by all means, do a little of that. But if you want to feel better, if you want to feel more energized uh, with this time and less bored, frankly, um, especially if you're going to not use those kinds of things like your phone and social media and television, choose activities that are demanding of your attention and mental energy. And that could be something as simple as putting together a puzzle with your family, uh, some kind of shared social activity that is often physical and has a result, a payoff at the end. Now, puzzle is a, a very simplistic version of that where you have to problem solve and work and search and hunt and you're using your hands and your eyes and pattern recognition to put this thing together. And at the end, you have a completed picture. Fabulous. But this could be things like home improvement activities. It could be playing a board game. It could be having some kind of hobby or project, knitting, painting, take your pick. Uh, typically, people respond well to a physical activity rather than something that is digital. So, you know, having a physical manifestation of your effort and thinking, if you're a writer or a painter or building something for your house or fixing something that's broken. That has tremendous psychological payoff. That's, that's, I mean, if you get dopamine from that, that's fabulous uh, because it's a positive activity uh, that's creating this positive reinforcement inside your mind. So finding those kinds of activities, and it's easy to find these kinds of activities. And it can be as simple as playing a game together having a conversation, getting a, a deck of cards that prompts interesting conversations. If you're at a loss for what to say to someone that you've maybe lived with for 20 plus years to bring up new ideas and topics, it's all possible, but it requires the engagement of the mind and a little creativity or problem solving, which feels counterintuitive often because we tend to, um, use our phones or TV in a, a lean back context, leaning back both physically, but also mentally kind of disengaging the brain and letting what's on the screen in front of us, whether it's four inches or 40 inches, dictate what's going on in here, right? So that's a big part of it is taking some responsibility for for that and saying, I'm gonna to choose to expend some energy even though it feels counterintuitive after a long, long day. And back from it, I'm gonna get this rush of good energy and feel more energized, more accomplished. And maybe even thinking about, well, tomorrow after work, I'm gonna do this or this weekend, we're gonna do all these other activities instead of scrolling feeds or watching TV or playing around on the internet. So that's, that's a, you know, a little bit about it, but I'll pause there before I ramble on yeah. and on. No, you aren't rambling, Rabbi. So much of it has to do with mindset. Uh, and, you know, what's the difference between work and recreation? You know, I watch people jog. And mm. I wonder why in the world would anybody do this? <laughs> <laughs> Intentionality. But, yeah, it's, you know, you, you see people at the gym, you know, sweating and grunting <laughs> and, and uh, you know nobody's forcing them to be there they're there because they recognize the value and i mean i, I schedule my workouts uh, in the in the late afternoon because that's when i start flagging i'm not very productive i've, I've been working all day i get up early and i just don't feel you know I'm, it's not even how i feel like being productive i just i'm not productive so exert myself it's good for me. And it also gets things moving again. So having that you know, attitude focus that, yeah, while I, I just feel like sitting back, 
and letting everything go. But intellectually, I can understand that I'm actually serving my own interests better. I'm serving my own physical and mental health better if I develop the discipline to make use of time in a way that is rewarding. Oh. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of human psychology in there, isn't there, doctor? Yep, thank goodness. Keeps me busy. <laughs> With why, intention, and will. Having a strong why, being having a, 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 a close connection or a tight connection to the outcome you want to see. Intention, setting the intention of I'm going to get there and will, your willpower to actually do the things that deliver on that and get you to the why. It's those W-I-W, it's the three layers that are so important. If you don't have a strong why, the other two will never follow. If you see a why, which can be, you know, seeing someone else that you know who has accomplished that thing. Oh, they started working out and they look great. I want that too. Bingo, you've got your strong why. And so you set your intention based on that. That's like, oh, I see the North Star over there. I want to move towards that. My intention is to go there. So I'm going to orient myself towards that. But then it's the willpower that's the machine that gets you there. If you don't engage that willpower, you can keep staring at that star, but you ain't going to move towards it. So it's those three layers that you just hit on so eloquently that, that a lot of us don't even pay attention enough to get to the why. And what are the layers of? Let's identify it so it's easier for everyone to remember. Well, what are they layers of? Um, uh, so I, I, typically how I think about it is um, intention is your soul. It comes from your soul. It's the, the divine side of you that's saying, this is what would be good for you. This is your intention. And will is the connection between soul and physical body and, and the sensory experience of the body, which can experience some inertia. We have brains with deeply grooved patterns in them of how we behave. And you have your soul saying, do something that doesn't fit into one of those patterns. It requires tremendous willpower, which is that connection between the two. Um, yeah, I, thought, I thought I was the rabbi here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry well, if I'm out of my depth. But no, what you're saying is it is beautiful. I love the way you just formulated that because the intention does come from the soul and the will is the connection to the physical. And then the sages teach nothing stands before will. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? If you really want something and you're prepared to do what's necessary to get it, heaven and earth will just get out of your way. <laughs> yes. And why don't we succeed? because we're just not that committed. Either we don't want it that much or we're not prepared to give up what we need to, or better way to say it, to invest what we need to, mm -hmm. to get there. Yeah. So. The, I think know, sometimes uh, we don't know how to. I think, um, yeah. I think a lot of times, um, well, you know, as a psychologist, one thing that, that it always strikes me is people are afraid of failing. So they're afraid of sitting with their own thoughts. Um, whether you're silent for a minute or a whole day, or whether you're disconnected from your precious for a minute or for a meal, or it's still my precious. I don't care. I'm still going to call it my precious. I love it. It's wonderful. I want to be buried with it. Well, actually, I mean, this is my precious, okay? And it's such a lovely shade of red. I think we're going to have to end this episode right here. <laughs> that's, a, that's my precious anonymous. That's afterwards. Okay. But the, whole, the one thing I've learned, though, is that if you really want to do something, make sacred time for it. Not just ease into it sloppily. If you want to watch a Netflix show or like my daughter and son-in-law, they want to live on a yacht. So they're always watching the YouTube that talks about couples and families living on yachts. And they study that it's in the background a lot, but it's also part of their North star shooting for that star. So it's in the back, but they're paying attention and they do it intentionally. Um, my other daughter has a, a daughter who just hit middle school. Heaven help me. Okay. 
and she's so far still likes us and is nice. I don't know when she's going to turn, but we're looking for it. Um, but they make TikToks together. And what's interesting is that, you know, we've had that big fight about the TikToks and, you know, the, the verbal discussion about is it good, is it bad or whatever. Said, so, well, it's not good or bad. It's what you do with it. And I think that with kids, with parents, if they're too young, they need to know we have their logins. And I believe they need to know we're going to look at it with them in a sharing mode. If you can catch it young enough where they're still showing off and sharing, it doesn't look like you're spying, but rather that you're sharing in their creative endeavors. And that's one of the secrets is to pay attention and get it early if you can. Tremendous wisdom right there. That's for sure. Um, being involved in their lives, not just their lives in the traditional sense, but there's a whole other side of life happening in the virtual environment now through these social platforms. Yes. The, the, the co-creation of content with a, a child on these platforms, that's powerful engagement and involvement in their lives. And to your point, and I agree wholeheartedly, the way you use these technologies determines its positive or negative impact on you and the people consuming what you create uh, to, to a large extent. Now, th there is some there are some unhealthy things built into these technologies. Yes. And if we're not aware of them, they can get the best of us and harm so what us. are those? Well, it's the fact that these, um, the, the number one thing is the way the experience is designed to, in particular with feed-based social media. Yes. They always talk about the, the algorithm that determines what's going on in the feed. That is the collection of data they have about you as you scroll through your feed. You better believe that all of these social platforms are keeping track, they have a profile of your behavior, you know, they're, they're tracking what you engage with. And they, they see that, oh, you really spend a lot of time watching videos from these kinds of people, or these kinds of hashtags, or these kinds of themes. And what are they going to do? This is a very simplistic version of how it works. But they, they will show the next thing to you that's most likely to keep you engaged. And they Absolutely. want to keep you watching and watching and watching these, um, you know, you just tap and the next video shows up. This one's boring, tap or swipe and you're on to the next one. And it's fabulous and it's easy. And it, 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 you lose 30, 45 minutes of your day in the blink of an eye. You don't even realize it because they've made it so easy. And they've showed you stuff that they know will keep you hooked long enough so that they can show you a few more ads, make some more money off of you. And what's the what's lost here? Your life, your your time. You, more valuable than money is your time because you cannot earn more time. You can earn more money. You cannot earn more time. And we are giving our most valuable resource away to these platforms that are engineered to harvest it from us as much as possible in ways where we don't even realize it's happening. That whole like, oh man, I, I was just, you know, I got a notification from TikTok. I jumped in there and 30 minutes were lost. I didn't even mean for that to happen. I meant to go do this whole thing. And now- Rabba and I were talking about the black hole of the internet. Yeah. Um, yeah. That we get sucked into it, you know? NEM, NEM, it's a twister. I mean, we're yeah. in that vortex, you know? It really so, is. And it's designed to do that to you. And, it is. and there's a whole other array. I mean, it, it just came out in the Wall Street Journal this week that um, Facebook has internal... Uh, evidence that Instagram is a toxic platform for young women. Uh, they've done the research. They know it. Um, they've designed it in a way that doesn't protect people. It's like we're all driving these cars, it's the equivalent of driving cars without safety features. And when the government or people like us say like these social platforms need to implement safety features, and then they come back and they say, oh, well, I mean, we have billions of users. The, the cost of implementing those kinds of safety features would, would you know, make us so much less profitable. And we wouldn't be able to build as many cool new features that you all love so much because we'd have to divert those engineering resources and that money towards building out safety features. We just don't know if that makes a lot of business sense. That would be like the car companies uh, when Ralph Nader is testifying and, and saying, you know, we... We aren't building these vehicles safely. They need seatbelts, they need airbags, they need crumple zones. Them saying, 
we make so many cars a year. You know what, how much it would cost for us to implement those features? We'd have to lay people off. We'd have to raise prices. Da, 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 da. Uh, they, they have all these stories, but it sounds so ridiculous now, right? The idea it of does. us giving them permission to not implement those features for those business reasons. Yeah. And, oh, it's going to make them more expensive or whatever. Or secure uh, doors for the pilots, right? Which 20 oh. years ago would have uh, changed history in ways we never would have noticed. Oh right. my gosh. And in how about ways smoking? we never would have noticed. Yes. Do you remember when we smoked on airplanes and there was a smoking section? Do you remember that? <laughs> and people used to make fun of you if you complained. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that the rabbi and I keep ad addressing is the issue of groupthink and how we judge things and how easy it is to not grapple with the gray, which is the name of his book, um, but we want it black or white, that this is right or wrong. I mean, it's fascinating how that goes. So, so then let's go back to the practicality. Many parents, and just to be very frank, are failing at their attempts to help children create lives of harmony, where they have time for self and others time for the community, time for thinking, time for learning from others, time for learning from mistakes, all those kinds of things. So, sir, how do you advise them? Well, one of the first things is to enroll them together in the process of, hey, we want to change some habits that we have here around how we spend our time or set boundaries or use these devices or social media or television. Instead of saying, you're doing it wrong, and we're going to set some new rules in this house starting today. Young that man, kind of yeah. yeah, I mean, that that um, me versus you or us versus you approach doesn't work as well as enrolling them in a group process of let's pay some attention to how we're using our time and how we feel when we do these things. And enroll them in the process of setting boundaries. Hey, let's pay attention to how we feel when we watch TV all night or you use TikTok all day or pick, take your pick of thing that you feel like isn't serving you well or just everything, you know? I mean, I began my own journey with this by doing an audit of how I spend my time. And That's scary, my, isn't it? it it's, <laughs> I guess it can be. I, I didn't do you do it by the scary. five minutes, 10 minutes? How do you do your, how do you recommend a time audit? Well, you know, no one has the time to keep a very specific journal. I mean, ideally, you would keep a log of how you spend every minute of your day, but that's that's not really practical. So what I say is use the notes app in your phone, or if you carry a physical journal or something, um, at regular increments of the day, just reflect on how did I spend the past couple of hours? You know, was I looking at my computer doing XYZ task? Was I talking on the phone? Was I scrolling through social media? Was I eating dinner with my kids and having conversation? Um, yeah. Take an audit of those things loosely so that you can, at the end of a week or two, calculate well, you know, how many hours am I spending in front of a screen? And how many of those hours are spent on things that are productive or work-related or creative and, and meaningful, or are just total distractions zoning out, you know, watching television or scrolling feeds endlessly? Um, and, and get a sense of how are we doing? Let's take the temperature of the room. You know, maybe there's no problem here because I've had parents come to me that are already, you know, they've taken the fine tooth comb through their entire family's use of all these things. They've implemented all these rules, but for them, it, it, the, as a recovering perfectionist, it resonates. They are continuing to chase the long tail of this and trying to expunge it to a degree where they're actually doing more harm than good because they've already set so many rules. So it's a great way to see, how are we doing here? And so um, I'll have them do that. I'll ask them some questions. You can pull up your phone right now and go into your settings app and see how many hours a day are you spending on average on your device? Um, uh, of that time, you know, what are the top most used apps or visited websites? All of our phones do this now. Yes. So that's a great way to take a temp check. And that's really the first step here. It is acknowledging that maybe there's some change warranted here and taking stock of, well, what do we need to change? I, I imagine that's how you work with your clients to some degree too. They're like, hey, they might come to you and say, I need your help. I don't exactly know what the problem is, but I know there's a problem here and I want your well, advice on it. That's, it's, it's a similar usually thing. Usually they are. come to a psychologist or a consultant 
uh, whether it's a family or business coach, like with the rabbi and I, um, usually they come with an idea of what the problem is, and it's usually not identified accurately. So if it's a family, <laughs> that, that resonates. Yeah. they say it's this 12 year old. Mm -hmm. Well, later on, you realize the 12 year old is the voice piece for a source of disconnect and unhappiness in the whole family. And they're often the courageous voice piece for it. So I love misbehavior because it lets us know there's something that needs to be looked at. I've created something that I think I sounds that. like some of what you do, um, Giancarlo. I call it a no nagging contract. It's a family agreement. And everyone sits down and they talk about first, what fun do we want to have this week, next week, next month, the next month. And you look at all the fun stuff. And next you look at the obligation, los deberes. What do we need to do? So here's school, here's the doctor's appointment, here's the prayer cycle, here's the, you know, the combing of the beard time or, you know, whatever. I mean, you put all the things you need to do um, and then you kind of create rhythms and then everyone can decide what would work better. How can we have more fun? So I divided into me being Cuban. It's from waking up to, to breakfast, <laughs> breakfast to the time you leave for school or work. And then of course you, you know, you have the work time if, or school time if they're home. And then you have when they come home to dinner and then dinner to bedtime. Yeah. So yeah. you, you yeah. break it up. And then a lot of times I give kids uh, the dry erase magic markers and put them on windows or doors that are glass. Say, come up with a schedule and a list that makes sense. And every, and then each of the kids come up with proposals. It's fun. And they're always smarter than we are. And sometimes they're harder on themselves than we are. Well, that's just brilliant. I love it so much. Um, it's, it gets back to something you were saying before about how um, there's a little bit of fear of the unknown, or we just, you know, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know how to even begin on this process. You know, when we were talking about um, having a why and an intention and willpower, it's like, well, that sounds great conceptually. Like, sign, mm -hmm. like very few people would say, I don't want that. It's the question of, well, how do I turn that from concept or theory into practice? Yes. And what you've done is you don't even need to know those other things, the conceptual things, the technique that you've given makes it happen, it facilitates. Yes. Now it's always Not helpful true. people know the why and know the concept. That's where real wisdom comes from is when you can explain why you do what you do instead of just, well, I'm really good at this thing. I don't know why, but I am. So fabulous that you've got that. And that I talk about um, how Ben Franklin would plan his days because he was very methodical about creating what? structure in his day. And I love, there's like a, a excerpt from his journal that talks about how he structures his days. And that's what you're talking about, organizing, you know, what, what's the good stuff, what's the gotta do's that are maybe not as fun, the chores and homework and things. But when you take it all in account together, it actually relieves you, the parent, of having to be the nag and only focusing on that stuff because they're naturally going to do things, spend time on the things that they love. Mm -hmm. But if you can paint that picture together and look at it holistically, I, I think there's so much wisdom in what you just laid out there. That's beautiful. You know what I really like about it? You, you mentioned Ben Franklin, and, and you know, I'm fascinated by him. Hmm. Um, I mean, well, you he, remind me of him some, uh, Rabbi. Well, <laughs> we'll see if that's a good thing or not. But <laughs> it's the In long In some hair. ways, yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the thing about him, he's brilliant. He was you know, way ahead of his time. He, we have these records of him, of, of how to discipline your life and, and how to make decisions. But in his personal life, he was incredibly undisciplined. Um, you know, at the end of his life, he was carried around by, um, by you know, four people holding one of those, those I forget what they're called, the, like, the, like the, the princes, the Indian princes, because he was so corpulent, he couldn't, he couldn't carry his own weight. Yep. And they don't even know how many children he followed. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. He... You, you, you can have, and it goes back to, to John, what you, you formulated about the will, which is the connection between the intention with the willingness to put it into action. Mm -hmm. And what, what I, I agree is, is so, what I really like about your, your, the plan you laid out, Doctor, is that you sort of created a system that builds its own structure and builds its own boundaries. 
Yes. Because if you, when you said boundaries, I mean, you, you've written about a book about anger, I believe, that um, you know, children love to test boundaries. And part of it is the subconscious desire to make sure their parents are really in control. Yes. <laughs> because, and especially adolescents who are conflicted, right? They, they want to be independent, but they know they're not ready to be. And, and little children who want a re reaffirmation that someone's in charge and watching over them. And as we allow the boundaries of our lives to break down, we are creating a sense of insecurity for ourselves. Yes. Which just leads to so much anxiety and uncertainty. And then we retreat into these devices because that gives us the dopamine that offsets the anxiety. Whereas a really simple formula like yours can help us recover that sense of order and structure and boundaries in our lives. So well done. Truly, yes. The trust, it's uh, create some self-trust. That's what, um, if you can get someone to start taking those actions, creating the no-nag contract, for instance, it sets into motion a, a, a positive reinforcing effect, this cycle of good, because once you go through the process and you start getting the hang of it, 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 it you feel the benefits of it. Like it feels good to exercise willpower and to enjoy the benefits from it. And, and boundaries yeah. are, are willpower in the sense of time or, or behaviors or habits. And um, they're power because you can tell the kids can say, shut me up. If you do what you're supposed to do, when and how you're supposed to do it, I can't say a thing, but well done. Yeah. It gives people power and like what the rabbi was saying, safety. Because a good boundary makes you feel safe enough to take risks, to grow. Like what you're doing, Giancarlo, you're, you're trying to do things differently. And um, obviously, if we don't feel safe or loved, we can create new things. Not as easily. Oh, so We true. can, but not as easily. Yeah, that's for sure. Wow. Yeah, that's if you can see that things are better if I do things differently. You know, it's an everything could be an experiment instead of like, a, oh, I don't know about that. You know, the fear thing. Well, let's try it out. Let's see what happens. Let's do the the research. Um, let's try this no nag contract. See how it goes. And if the results are good, maybe we'll do more of it. And if the results are good, maybe life gets a little better and our our dynamics, our relationship at home gets a little I think better. I wonderful. think that's wonderful. Rabbi, I think maybe it's time for the word of the day. When we come back to you, maybe John Carlo can give us a call to action on this issue of boundaries and, and creating a more fulfilling life on purpose. Well, I'll, I'll introduce the word of the day. It's one of my favorite quotes. That boredom is the clash between ambition and laziness. Ooh, say that again, way pithy. Boredom is the clash between ambition and laziness. Is this your quote? Yes, wasn't that slick? I, it was very slick, actually. <laughs> I'm going to make a meme out of it. That's fun. I want to unpack that. <laughs> I'm going to have to come back again. And we'll get... <laughs> Oh, shucks. That the, sounds good to me. I mean, so tell us about it. Is that, that we, we want to achieve. I mean, that's, that's part of human nature. We were, we're builders. We're creators. We, we want to impose or project our vision of a better world on our reality. And for whatever reason, we're not sure how to get there. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of succeeding. We're... Um, we're, we're afraid what people are going to say, or we just don't want to expend the effort. And so part of us wants to take action, and part of us wants the sedentary, you know, wants to give into inertia. And the result is this feeling of, of, of anxiety that we call boredom. And we distract ourselves so that we don't have to deal with. And that introduces the word of the day, which is enervate. I learned this word in the 1970 movie, The Owl and the Pussycat with uh, George Siegel and Barbara Streisand. Um, and it became a, it's a running theme through the, through the movie. But what really caught me about it is, is their comment that enervate means the opposite of what people think it means. Because most people 
aren't familiar with the word. It's not used often. And it sounds like it ought to mean energize, when in fact it's the opposite. To be enervated means to be drained of energy. And what you've been articulating, Giancarlo, is all the ways that we enervate ourselves because it, it's like, um, you know, it, it's like a, a, a car engine. I'm, I'm dating myself. I don't know. If you, do they use spark plug, plugs anymore in engines? <laughs> I don't know. You, 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 need, you need the spark to light the fuel to make the engine go, which then burns more fuel in order to propel the car. We need to spark ourselves. We need to ignite ourselves into action, purposeful, meaningful, rewarding action. And that gener that expenditure of energy will energize us. But if we think we're going to recharge our batteries by being completely passive, we'll actually become more enervated and be less inclined to move ourselves forward. So good. That's a no, great- No wonder people are frustrated. I loved your quote, Rabbi. I thought that was great. Boredom is the clash between ambition and laziness. Way deep, sir. I'm putting Scary. that in the chat. <laughs> I wrote that one down for sure. That's fantastic. Well, we'll, we'll, post, we'll post the meme. Yes, post the meme indeed. Beautiful. Well, um, so you know, Charlotte says before you do your final thing, Giancarlo, thank you for mentioning fear of success along with fear of failure, Rabbi. Often fear of success comes from fearing how success will reorient relationships. So we lose the people we uh, belong with, I think, especially with women. Many times women have lost a lot if they have taken the plunge in doing successful things. Um, and maybe I am adding that because it's my experience. Would you guys agree with that or no? I think it's more complicated for women. I think so. Definitely. There'll yeah. be a time that it isn't now that we're mindful of, of um, pronouns and all of that. Maybe, maybe that will change. I don't know. Be interesting. It, it feels uh, like it's changing. I, it does feel like it's changing. I think there'll always be some stinginess with people, with other people's success and people not wanting others to outgrow them. And but that's human nature. That's not the same thing as a cultural phenomenon, you know? Yeah. All right. Your last call to action, sir. <laughs> last call to action. So as a family, start paying attention to how you spend your time individually, together, um, that could be as simple as pulling up the phone settings like I was talking about and taking a look at how all of you are spending your time on these devices and what you're using them for and asking yourselves, how do we feel about that? And you know, most people see social media as in the top tier of most used apps uh, on, on their phones in that five hours a day plus that we spend on average on our devices. Ask yourself, if I could get an hour of that time back every day, what would I choose to spend it on? Would it have been the same thing or something else? And what is that something else? And what do we want to cultivate together with that time if we were to all agree to get that back? So in, in all of that that I just said is paying attention to how you spend your time carving out a chunk of it as a boundary for something new to grow and enrolling others, whether it's yourself, enrolling yourself or enrolling others in your household with you in a process of filling that time with something that is um, enlivening, that, that gives that spark, that I I ignition um, into action uh, to get away from uh, boredom and, and spend some meaningful time together. Wow, that is lovely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today, too. It's always so much fun to explore these topics with you, too. And I, I always feel like there's so much left on the table when we're done in terms of fruitful things to unpack. Um, that's what I appreciate about the both of you. Um, just uh, really wise and thoughtful territory uh, comes up every time. We'll definitely look forward to future conversations. And, yes, uh, please doctor, do join us again. Doctor, do you have a last word for us? Oh, I always do. First off, um, I'm going to, uh, along with what uh, Giancarlo had said, 
I'm going to give everyone a challenge. Ask yourself today, did I do something fun first thing in the morning? I believe that we're corrupt if we wake up for work or some sort of obligation. I think we need to wake up for something that is meaning for us. Love, sex, children, God, cooking, doing something, reading. I think we need to start with our values. And I do believe if we wake up to our values, I think it'll be easier for us to want to wake up and therefore easier to want to go to bed without a screen because going to bed with a screen mm -hmm. keeps you awake. Mm -hmm. Not only do the lights mess with your cones, but I don't know about you with the pressures. It's hard to, you know, you know Netflix knows me. You want another one? Yes, another one. They don't even ask me anymore. So I have to put in that thing. Please ask me each time or I might just forget and roll into the next one. And pretty soon I'm binging instead of sleeping. So that is my next thing. Are you living a corrupt life by letting others and work set the tone for you? That's that's my challenge. Love it. Also. Yeah. All right. Well, we will see you all. Um, and I'll I'll put in again. Um, as always, the website for uh, Giancarlo, so you can check it out. Um, let me see, Purposeful uh, NYC is the one I have. And then I want you to look at the rabbi and I are working on getting people to be able to react more. I put two links there, one for our Facebook and one for our LinkedIn. It's the rabbi and the shrink. And then our website is the rabbi and the shrink.com. So let us know what you think, ask us questions so that when people like Giancarlo comes and when he does come again, then we'll have really great um, challenges to pose him so he can fit your need. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us on The Rabbi and the Shrink. See you every Tuesday at 1230 p.m. ET. Bye. <laughs>